Guys, um, today is a new podcast. I guess it's a new way of um, doing my YouTube videos. I think podcasts are great because um, it's more of an informal chat. Today I've got Lane, who's a compounding pharmacist. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She's very experienced, and her interest is in skin. In skin dermatology, melasma. Very good. So today we're having just a chat in regards to uh, pigmentation. Yeah? Yes. Um, so melasma. So as the I guess clinician, we see a lot of melasma, especially in in Queensland because of the UV. Um, and there are many controversies um, in regards to how to treat melasma. Yeah. Yeah. One of the yeah. biggest I guess uh, barriers as a dermatologist that we face is the safety profile of hydroquinone. Yes. Yeah. In your experience, what, what do you think of hydroquinone, just in general? Um, hydroquinone is still really first-line therapy, still to this day. Um, it's very taboo now. A lot of people don't want to avoid hydroquinone, and especially with pregnancy and breastfeeding and all that jazz. Um, but it seems to be the most effective. It is still Agreed. the most effective. Yeah. 100%, um, yes. Yeah, so, and, you know, yeah. especially in the first eight weeks, I yes. think it's paramount that you do something that really works. Yes. Yeah. I totally agree, yeah, because uh, even when we read the journals and even when we look at the literature, uh, no matter what's out there, whether the melodone, melorate, melocream, all the different acid botanicals, um, all those tyrosinase inhibitors, yeah. cystamine, the whole lot, um, most dermatologists agree that by far the hydroquinone gives the best response. Yes, yeah. that's right. In, in your experience, what, uh, what do you think is the tipping point where they may get skin irritation? I think if you use it too much yep. or too often, a lot of people use it like a moisturizer, especially if it's in a good base, they think, oh, I'll just smack more of it on. Um, that's not necessarily the case. I think go slow um, yep. is the best, and obviously only at night. Um, sun exposure is, is obviously yeah. Yeah. terrible. So, so, so what, what about, what about mm. the concentration? We're going to pick the concentration. Where yeah. do you say, what, what do you think? In, in most patients, what's the tipping point where they may get irritation? Yeah. Yeah? Well, to be honest, anything less than two is just not effective. Yeah. So right. I think 4% yep. Um, yep. is a really good starting point. And yep. some people who can tolerate it more, who've used it before, I would say 5%. Yep. Yep. And any more than that, you're just getting the irritation. Yeah. And, and that's, yeah, and I guess, I mean, a lot of dermatologists, especially in the US, yeah, we uh, prescribe the Kligman's formulation, yeah? Yes. Uh, so we don't have the uh, equivalent Kligman's here as an over-the-counter, but you compound yes, it, yeah? Yes, so that's one of my most compounded products, yep, is, yep. Um, the Kligman's, or modified Kligman's, because cool. doctors like to mix and match the yes, steroid yes. and the... So what's your, what's your favorite recipe, um, without re revealing too much in the way of uh, what you do, what's your favorite concentrations and mix in the context of Kligman's? Well, my secret formula then is um, the hydroquinone, and then I like to put vitamin A, obviously, tretinoin, yep. is um, what, what that strength? salt to what over, 0.05, yep. um, and then vitamin C. Yep, and ascorbic that's, acid yeah. to stabilize things yes, as well. Yes, that's yeah. right, because all these all these melasma things oxidize really yes, quickly. Yes. So, um, ascorbic acid, and then I like to put a steroid, but not a very strong one. Um, what do you What do you like? Depends. Using? You can use desonide. Now, desonide is probably the most popular yes, one. Yes. Yes. Um, some people use hydrocortisone. Yep. I prefer hydrocortisone because yep. it's milder. Yep. And it still lets the drug penetrate. Yeah. You know? yep, yep. So yeah. Oh, very I cool. That one. Very cool. So I mean, um, in Overseas and I guess in the US, uh, you can actually buy the formulation. Yeah? Yes, that's right. So you don't need a, a pharmacist to compound. But the great thing, I guess, when you see a pharmacist and when we work in with, with you guys, is that we can give bespoke concentrations yes, to patients. Right, that's yeah. right, especially for those sensitive patients who yeah. can't tolerate 5%. Uh, absolutely, you know? yeah. yeah. Um, so for patients who can't tolerate 5%, generally my go-to is 3 yeah, so it's in between yeah. 2 it's in between 4 yeah, yeah. so 3%, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, I often start, uh, you know my routine, yeah, so I start people on 3 nights per week increasing this tolerated um, yeah. and decreasing this problems. Um, there's some new, I guess, there's some controversial things out there, um, Abaji for example, yeah, uh, just bought this textbook. Yeah. <laughs> So, are you aware of his uh, his protocols for hydroquinone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Twice so a day. Yes. Twice yes. a day, six months. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I personally think, as a dermatologist, twice a day probably is a not. Bit too much. Is a bit too yeah. much. Yeah. yeah. I think you're going to 
realistically cause some possible uh, erythmin reaction. Yes, yeah? that's right. Especially that's right. with any formulation at 4% or above. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, so it's not that I'm saying a budget is wrong. All I'm saying is that um, in the context of what we see clinically yeah. and the outcomes. Yeah. And, you know, when there's, um, when you're using too much, then you're putting, you're disposing yourself to more sun damage. Yes, and then yes. you're chasing your tail. Yes, you know? yes, yeah. uh, absolutely, yeah. So hydroquinone, guys, look, it's still the bread and butter of um, treating melasma and even post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Um, this is what dermatologists throughout the world use. I think the safety profile is there, and I think it's exaggerated by um, certain subgroups. In other words, they say it's carcinogenic. I think in big concentrations, and if you're a rat, it can be custodian. Yeah, that's because right. We don't actually... Or if you're pumping them <laughs> until they die. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think in the most dermatologists, yeah, most dermatologists agree it's a pretty safe formulation. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. So moving away from hydroquinone, um, my guidelines is that patients are on HQ for about maximum about six months until I give yeah. them a break for about okay. six weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So in that break, we need to actually reduce the amount of um, pigment, the yeah, amount of melanin, so we use another tyrosinase inhibitor. Yeah. What is your take on the botanicals that are now in fashion in yeah. regards to... Yeah. Yeah? Um, well, yeah, but I like to use hydroquinone for eight weeks maybe, yep. and then put them on something else with hydroquinone, just so that they have something else to combat the melasma with. I love glycolics, you know, mm -hmm. the AHA, the lactics. Um, and then the BHA as well, they're really good and they're tyrosinase inhibitors. Mm -hmm. And there's also um, the tyrosinase transfers inhibitors, which are marcinamide. Love vitamin B3 yep. because you're preventing, essentially you're preventing the melanin from reaching the melanocytes. Yes, yes. So, uh, you know, that's when we get the pigments. So I guess uh, vitamin B3 is my all-time favorite. Yes. And it's not photosensitive, so you can wear it during the day, at night as well. <laughs> so what are we on about? No, I send them out. Yeah, no, I send them out. So, um, yes, it's one of my favorites as well, yeah? Yeah. Um, I don't quite like using in... I guess in patients with sensitive skin, I'm going to change the topic. What's your take on ascorbic acid as a general um, uh, skincare essential, yeah? It's great if you're a little bit older and you want that brightening effect if you don't suffer from acne yep. um, or sensitivity. Yep. But um, personally, because I have such acneic skin, I can put vitamin C on, I'll always break out. Yep. Sunscreen, I'll always yep. break out. There are certain types of things I just have to avoid. Yeah, yeah. I mean, thoroughly agree, yeah, because ascorbic acid, I think vitamin C, when they actually use that for um, optimal bioavailability, they stay anywhere between pH between 2 and 2.5. Yes. Is that your experience as yes. well? Yes, yeah. that's right. And I think if you're going to put that kind of stuff on sensitive skin or someone who's got rosacea form or rosacea-like yeah, right. uh, symptoms, generally speaking, you're going to get a flare-up. Yeah, up, yeah. that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So I think when, you, when we look at pigment inhibitors out there, guys, um, it, it has to be bespoke for that patient because... Yes. You know, some patients say, look, I've done really well with ascorbic acid. Um, it doesn't mean that everyone's going to do well with ascorbic acid. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think what Lane offers in the context of bespoke formulations is probably great for those patients, especially if you need um, things because you've got sensitive skin. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And Everyone cool. has sensitive skin now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think um, skin sensitivity, just, just looking at papers, it's gone up to, it's a ridiculous figure, up to 60% of patients are skin yeah. sensitive, are, are sensitive. I personally think it's because um, we're using a lot more products. Yes, yeah, that's right, that's right. And when you have a look at, I guess, with uh, The Ordinary, for example, where they sell um, skincare so cheap, cheap that, yes. that someone with 50 bucks can actually buy, yeah. uh, realistically, eight or nine different formulations. Yes. I think... The ordinary is great in the sense that it's given people the ingredients, but I think the flip side is that patients, when they look at the, or, or consumers, when they look at things, it's go, all marketing. Yeah, it's all they marketing, yeah. yeah. And they go, cool, you know what, I'm going to buy this, um, you know, a retinol, I'll even use a, a um, glycolic scrub and add the scorbic yeah, acid, there's a whole right. lot, and their face turns out worse. You're layering, one you're layering one yeah, one. yeah. And I think, you know, every skincare company has their pros and cons, yeah? And I think um, in, in the context of the ordinary, they've done well in the sense that um, they've allowed skincare to be affordable to the mass uh, yeah. population. The flip side, however, is that people don't really know or, or not trained to combine certain things. Yeah, that's right. And um, often on the packaging it says for brightening or for yes, clearer skin, yes. that's just fake. 
uh, absolutely, it can be yeah. anything. So absolutely. if someone wants bright skin and clear skin and you know, so they just no start, wrinkles. yeah, yeah. yeah start adding everything yeah, up, thinking right. the more the merrier. But at the end of the day, we know that skin has a threshold, yes. yeah. And as soon as you exceed that threshold, you're gone, yeah, <laughs> because the skin actually gets irritated. And it takes a long time before you settle that irritation. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. well, the turnover is every six months. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so, guys, look, um, what we're doing is, I guess, a little conversation here in regards to um, uh, pigment. So, let's go back on track with the pigment. Yes. So, when, when it comes to things like melodone, melorace, melocream, yeah, I think they market that as a, um, um, a more of a natural type of skincare regime, yeah, where there's hydroquinone free. Um, and they combine many things, um, as in even things like licorice, bearberry extract, yes. ascorbic acid, um, glycolic acid, citric acid, a whole lot. Yeah. What's your take on these uh, formulations in comparison to, let's say, uh, hydroquinone? Yeah. Well, I think these formulations, there's certainly a place for it because you can't be on hydroquinone forever. Yep. You know, it's going to be too sensitive. You're yep. going to get sensitization. Um, so we need to have something to. Um, go to for long term to yep. prevent it because essentially what we want to do is prevent it yep. from coming back So there's definitely something in that but in the first initial eight weeks It's not going to have much effect. Yes, you're going to want something a bit stronger with a bit more bite Yeah, you know, yep. with a steroid cool, perhaps. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah cool, cool. So look, I think we can agree that um, in the context of pigmentation and how I guess dermatologists working with um, uh, pharmacists especially compounding pharmacists Number one is still hydroquinone, yeah? yes. Um, but the, like we've, I guess, discussed, the main thing with the hydroquinone is we've got to find a formulation which agrees with the patient. Yes, yeah? that's right. And which I think between three and five. Within three and five, I thoroughly agree. Because hydroquinone, uh, like we've we've said many times here, the higher the concentration, the greater the irritant potential. Yes. Yeah. So which means if you react to hydroquinone, most of the time you're not allergic to it you basically have skin irritation. Yes, yeah? that's right. So we talked about HQ. The second probably would be, what, what's your second pick when it comes to, uh, I guess, just to summarize, in regards to uh, decreasing the amount of pigment, tyrosinase Um I would say vitamin B and AHAs. Cool, cool. Yeah. I, I agree, yeah. So uh, vitamin B, no, niacinamide, um, it, it's, it's good, yeah. Um, and then down the track, where what would be your fourth and fifth line uh, therapies? Um, I love Kojic, but Kojic is a little bit of a hit and miss because it can also cause sensitivity. Yes, yes. More than, um, it's usually between 1-3% to 3 of formulation. Yes, that's right. That's I think, right. So I think the sweet yeah, spot's 2%. 2%, yeah. yeah, because dermatologists uh, usually go, once it hits around 3%, probably not advisable because of the skin irritation. Yes, yeah. that's right. So Kojic, I like yeah. Kojic. Um, it certainly works, but yes. again, the sensitivity. Um, Arbutin is also lovely. Arbutin yep. worked very well. Yep. Very expensive compound, Yes, Arbutin. yes. But it works, yeah, and it's also fairly natural. Cool, cool. Yeah. Moving down the line, I guess what we're trying to do is just illustrate all of the treatments out there, all the different. So we haven't even gone into lasers, which is how yeah. I normally treat things. Yeah, we're talk, just talking about skincare today. Um, so what about the other things down down the down the track? For example, yeah. like Lytera, How how do you? Lytera is also something like millicream. They're yeah. all in the same licorice, yeah. spectrum. Yes, yeah. licorice um, extracts. And berry and all that. Berry, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and anything that has ascorbic acid, and a lot of things have ascorbic acid in it now. A lot of berries have, yeah, have yeah. it. Um, and I think monthly peels and things like that yeah. are very, very important because they prevent. Yeah. So again, we want to prevent it instead of always treating it. Treating, yeah. That's the yeah. idea. Yeah. So monthly peels are essential. Cool, cool. Yeah. Guys, I hope you like this uh, segment. Yeah, this is just one uh, new podcast, and I think it's great that I can actually chat to yes. to Lane in regards to skincare because it's you know uh, we do see uh, things clinically, but I think the uh, person who's formulating plays a vital role in the outcome. Well, thanks for having me, David. You're right. We'll see. Uh, we'll see you again uh, next week. Bye for now. Bye.